Okay, ready? Okay. Yeah, we can start. in the embedded and automotive line of business at ARM. And now we start with the first presentation. Thank you, Ralph. So welcome everybody to my talk on adding vision to your next embedded product. Uh, and I hope that every one of you has something to take away from this talk today. As I was telling Ralph, I'm, I've recently joined as a product manager and before this I was uh, in research in ARM. Uh, so I've worked a lot with universities. So let me just start by um, what I'm going to talk to you about. So firstly, I want to present the landscape of how vision will unlock new markets and new applications uh, for all of us here. And specifically, how this uh, will happen is because uh, vision based on deep learning has been uh, ramping up a lot, and this has been a technology shift that we see. And this is, uh, it clearly has an advantage because Deep learning enables extraction of features autom automatically. Uh, and another trend that we see is that more and more compute is moving away from the cloud and near the edge, and this helps to make embedded vision scalable. A key enabler for this to happen in, uh, in a way that everyone can make the most of vision technology is um, the libraries and uh, software that can help to implement applications on embedded hardware. And this means that with such libraries that are optimized for hardware, it means you don't have to be an expert in vision technology and in hardware uh, to bring up such applications. So just to put my key message up front, what, what I'm going to demonstrate to you through this talk is that uh, accessible hardware in combination with open source software optimized for this hardware uh, is um, the way uh, to make, make it easier to bring embedded vision uh, technology to the market and products to the market. And this is way easier today compared to a few years ago because of the advancements that we are seeing. So let me start with some use cases, uh, starting with the top left. Uh, it's, this is a smartphone-based app that automatically detects plant diseases in cassava plants, and uh, this has near 100% accuracy in detection. Then here is a, a Raspberry Pi-based uh, device, so based on um, ARM processor, and this will uh, automatically detect a cucumber plant so that um, farmers can uh, really save time and effort. Uh, then on the right side, this is a autonomous uh, camera drone uh, that uh, can be used for tracking uh, people and, for example, if athletes are doing their fitness activities, uh, they can be automatically filmed, which is a very convenient thing. Then there is a social companion robot that is um, actually helping elderly people 
it automatically uh, recognizes people and turns its head heads to turns its head towards the person and interacts with the person again enabled by vision technology um, with arm processors and finally a reindeer camera this is helping to reduce accidents on train lines in remote parts of norway by detecting a herd of reindeer approaching the train track and alerting the train operator so you can see that these are really uh, useful um, and uh, big potential for such applications to improve our day-to-day -day lives. And my favorite one here is the drone, and I'm going to show you a quick video of it, just to highlight how technology can create richer experiences. Our initial focus has been to deliver on that promise of the autonomous flying camera and to make it real. Basically to create a film crew that fits in your backpack. It's a camera that understands the scene it's looking at and has the ability to move itself. Those two things together are just enormously powerful. This is a very ambitious product, and to make it possible, we had to develop custom hardware. We built a device with 13 cameras that see in every direction, and at its core, it uses an NVIDIA TX1. It's the same thing that's found in self-driving cars. So yeah, I hope you're convinced now, but let's take a step back and see, you know, what, is, what does it mean by Embedded Vision? So Embedded Vision Alliance, refers to embedded vision as the practical use of computer vision in machines uh, so that they can understand their environment using visual means. Uh, to project some of the market uh, potential here, I'm going to present a few stats. Uh, security and IP camera has seen an annual growth rate of 20% and estimated to be 500 million shipped units in 2021. Uh, personal robots have seen a really high 75% year-on-year growth rate. And smart home devices are reaching, estimated to reach 88 million up to 2021. So now, you know, how you can see that vision is enabling the next wave of embedded intelligence, right? So let's break it down uh, from a technical viewpoint. What are the problems here? So we can break this down into some sub-problems like analyzing the environment, the scene, detecting objects, uh, detecting a change in the scene, and recognizing objects. These are some of the primary problems. And the main problem here is extracting features from this visual, such as edges, corners, and objects. And this is one of the main technical problems. Now, how do we go about solving this, right? Uh, one of the uh, you know, major observations is that we cannot really uh, use uh, classic rules-based programming. It's nearly impossible to use that to identify these features and extract these features. Then from that, we have traditional vision technology as a second technique in the middle here. And for that, you really need to be an expert to know which features to extract for a particular class of ob objects, which algorithms to use, and how to fine tune them. Then on the extreme right here, uh, I show that vision using deep learning is um, a, a new way, relatively new way, to do this, to solve this problem of object detection and feature detection. And this uses end-to-end uh, -end object detection automatically, uh, automatically um, recognizing the features and uh, recognizing objects. So a prerequisite for this technique is that you must have a large amount of data. You must have uh, a big image data set. Uh, but this technique is gaining a lot of momentum, uh, and a lot of researchers believe that it will not replace traditional vision, but it will complement it nicely, and it has a very clear advantage of automatically ex extracting features. And so because you don't have to look inside the box, and you don't have to fine-tune these parameters, this makes vision accessible to everyone with a camera. That's my key message for this slide. Now, very quickly, in one slide, I'm going to explain the basics of machine learning. So deep learning is a subset of machine learning. And at the heart of deep learning, uh, at the core of it, you have the neural network. So a neural network, architecturally, is based on the structure of a brain. You have a network that transforms an input through sequence of layers. And in each layer comprises uh, of neurons. And each neuron has a set of weights and neurons between successive layers are connected to each other. Now, at the, output, at the output layer of this neural network, you get some sort of answer, like this is your cat. 
Now, machine learning and deep learning, which is a subset, to actually use this, you have from the, you know, for the full methodology, you have two phases, training and inference. So training, which is shown on the top, the training phase, it involves uh, using a large data set to um, uh, configure the weights of the neural network, the set of weights. And once you're done with the training phase, what comes out is a model, and this model has the pre-configured uh, weights of the neural network. So uh, it now predicts the correct answer for the data that you have used for training. Let's go to the second phase, which is called inference. Now, inference is where you deploy this model to your embedded devices, for example, your smart doorbell. And in an inference, you give it a new image, and at, if it's trained well, then at the output, it's going to give you the correct answer. For example, it's going to say this is a cat, and uh, a very important uh, aspect of design uh, is um, to have an accurate prediction of the answer. And this enables a good user experience. So the, the example here is showing 97% accuracy in prediction. So the deep learning based vision has uh, improved the performance, accuracy, as well as scalability uh, in a very significant way. So um, another trend that we see that actually complements um, uh, the story here is that uh, embedded devices, the compute capability is increasing at a very fast pace as well. And more compute is moving away from the cloud Insta, you know, over the network to our embedded devices. So what are the reasons uh, why we see this trend? If we don't have to send data over the network, then we save on the bandwidth of the network as well as uh, we get a quicker response, so we lower the latency. Additionally, as we reduce the burden from the cloud side, we have to use less uh, servers and less data, or at least you know, we don't have an ever-increasing demand on servers, so we reduce the power consumption overall. We also reduce cost because embedded devices are already present everywhere and they are really much cheaper than provisioning in the cloud. Uh, there are additional uh, uh, advantages, like in a certain context, you may not have network availability, so it might not be reliable to have a, a device that needs the internet, so you can have better reliability, and you can also have a more, uh, you know, less risk to uh, threats and attacks because uh, most, you know, a lot of attacks happen over the network. So from a security point of view, this is also an advantage. So I hope you're convinced that you know this is a big wave that we want to ride on, the embedded vision wave. Uh, I want to next go into some of the key ingredients that make it um, developer friendly to ride this wave of embedded vision. So machine learning and neural network based vision, two phases as I explained. So this slide will cover the training phase. Training uh, is usually um, really accomplished using open source software machine learning frameworks and these frameworks are uh, there are many types of frameworks. Uh, they are being contributed by academia as well as industry, and they are largely open source. Uh, what they allow you is to train a model. Again, um, there's uh, many data sets are available, uh, many image data sets are available. For example, ImageNet with tens of millions of images. And the training involves algorithms such as backpropagation, and it, it uh, typically needs to do a few iterations to get a good model out. Uh, and uh, there is, as I said, um, you know, many frameworks available. Pre-trained models are also available. For example, uh, with the CAFE framework, you have the model Zoo, and there are many problems that are, uh, can be solved using the pre-trained models from there. So if you're lucky, you're probably going to have a trained model or you're going to do it quite quickly. So going to the next second phase of deploying the model onto an embedded device to be able to do inference. Embedded devices, as I'm sure you know, have um, a constrained uh, environment in which they are uh, designed because they have to be energy efficient. So they are optimally designed for small memory and you know have uh, very uh, optimal compute capabilities. 
as it turns out the trained models cannot be used as is because of this difference because um, typically models have uh, floating point data and that means if you want to uh, look at the footprint of this network it's going to be a very large size in terms of memory and uh, your embedded chips typically have a small RAM so how does this work and neural networks as they are trained on large um, you know your standard desktop PCs or GPUs uh, they are large in size, their architecture is complex, they have many connections, many layers. So they don't have a natural uh, fit with the constrained embedded devices. So we run into this challenge here. You have a lot of advanced techniques from research where these models can be optimized. You have techniques such as quantization, uh, selection of the right architecture, uh, and then finally, with these um, uh, com uh, optimal techniques, uh, you can uh, reduce the size of this and make it uh, fit to the embedded device. But without an expert knowledge, uh, developers and might actually encounter this model optimization gap. And this term uh, is something uh, we define as when developers going from training to inference will find uh, a knowledge gap or an expertise gap. So um, can, does this mean that if you're not an expert, you can't really mm, uh, leverage all these open source uh, machine learning frameworks and deploy your model? Do you have to be an expert? So the answer is no. Um, one way to solve this or bridge this gap is libraries. So bridging this gap with libraries uh, is one of the oh, uh, solutions here. Uh, the libraries address this problem such by selecting networks which have a small architecture, which have a better fit to the embedded device. And they have, uh, typically, you know, a library has a set of functions uh, which are commonly found and which are optimized for the target hardware. Uh, we also uh, have scripts such as uh, to quantize uh, the data from floating point to fixed point so that you have less memory requirement. Uh, and uh, then, you know, you have more tuned performance and so that you can maintain the accuracy of the network. You know, the final user experience metric is that the network should give you a correct answer. So how do you go about with all these optimizations? And libraries really help you because they contain all the optimizations and hide the uh, complexity away from, from uh, users and developers. So the, the developers can simply just call the library API from their application code. So this is the, you know, um, the usefulness of libraries. Now ARM has uh, the CMSYS NN library, which is a set of optimized software kernels that are targeted for Cortex-M as well as Cortex-A devices. And these have been, uh, there has been a good amount of uptake for the Cortex-M based uh, CMSYS NN library. And this enables um, our ecosystem partners and uh, really anyone to build on top of them because they are open source. And these libraries, what can you do with them? They give you maximum performance by utilizing uh, the SIMD instructions in the ARM architecture. They minimize the footprint by applying all these advanced techniques on, on, the, on the kernels for neural network layers. Uh, and also they do some uh, optimizations such as weight reordering and uh, data layout uh, rearrangements. All of them are really specifically targeted to uh, fit the uh, chips and their compute capabilities based on Cortex-M, ARM Cortex-M processors and Cortex-A processors as well. And these give you a really high uplift um, compared to uh, vanilla or base 9 kernels that you can find from um, models. So let's look at an example gadget that brings all of this to life. Uh, here is um, a smart camera module by the company OpenMV. Uh, it's called the OpenMV Cam M7. And uh, in terms of hardware, it's a, it's a really small gadget and it is based on the SD micro part, uh, which is based on ARM Cortex M7 processor. And it, it has a 512 KB of RAM, which is roughly uh, you know, in line with what we have today, but it's not a lot compared to your PCs. Uh, what, also, it has an image signal processor, and this is a very key uh, component, which means if the image is good quality-wise, then your prediction will be good. 
And at ARM, we also have um, class-leading image signal processors, uh, the Mali C32 and Mali C52 that's recently been launched. So good quality image uh, is important for correct prediction. And what can you do with this? You can um, take pictures in a very controlled way and draw uh, on top of them, detect what it is and draw on top of them uh, in real time. And it can do things like face and eye detection, eye tracking, a barcode, QR code detection, and neural network inference. There are many examples available on this uh, website of OpenMV. And they're just example codes that you can use. So basically, this is telling us that you can purchase this board online. It's affordable, accessible. All the software is open source. And under the hood, it uses the ARM CMSYS NN optimized libraries. And it's just building on top of that with its own framework. Um, and everything is open source. Finally, it, it's using the MicroPython to uh, you know, write your application level code. And that's gaining a lot of popularity as well. So high-level languages, you don't need to know the hardware details at all. Uh, putting it all together, ARM OpenMV and the scripts as well as CMSYS NN library, this end-to-end -end flow is now almost fully automated. And this is how we see um, making embedded vision scalable and developer friendly so that you don't have to go in into and tuning things. It should just be very easy to use the scripts and libraries and bring up your applications. Now, this is an example of Cortex M7, and you know that runs typically RTOS. So you might be wondering, what if my use case is complex, or I want to run on Linux, then, then what do I do? So this brings me to the last section. There are a broad, there's a broad spectrum of applications. There's a huge market with many different needs, and, uh, and there are different hardware and software solutions. So here's um, you know, a broad spectrum. Um, machine learning, this shows actually the machine learning market requirements, performance requirements, which are typically expressed as operations per second. So starting with GOPS all the way to TOPS. So this um, is a good proxy because most of these applications, actually the vision operation or the vision is the dominant function of these operations. So this is a good representation of what kind of performance we need. And we could uh, use uh, different hardware IPs or software-only solutions uh, or software stacks to achieve these different requirements. Uh, one thing to note throughout uh, is from the IoT to, embed, uh, to the automotive is um, we always see that um, uh, customers always want the lowest power possible. So that's why we, we turn to embedded. Th this is always a demand, so for lowest power possible. Uh, so turning to how to enable uh, this broad range, right? So ARM have the ARM NN framework, which is neural network framework. And it is a whole software framework uh, for Android as well as for Linux. And ARM has donated this to Linaro uh, in order to accelerate the development of a common software interface for machine learning. And we really believe that working with um, partners and open source community will help us to get there in a way that we can leverage and reuse our, um, our efforts, and especially building software so that it can be compatible with different types of hardware. And here on the left, I show the Android uh, software stack, which is using, um, which is based on the Android NN API uh, context. That's what it leverages, uh, and you can um, use this for deploying inference on ARM Cortex M, Cortex, uh, ARM Cortex A processors, um, as well as the Mali GPU, and an upcoming ARM ML processor as well. And as I promised, there's also Linux. So embedded Linux on the right-hand side. Uh, this has a uh, ARM NN SDK scheduler, which is very similar to the um, you know, runtime and scheduler NN API on the left-hand side. And we can also use this software framework for uh, deploying inference for um, ARM Cortex A processors, Mali GPUs, and the upcoming ML processor, as well as third-party IP, because it's open source, you can also use it for third-party porting the software to third-party IP. So ARM actually um, is really committed to open source software. So to summarize the libraries that we have, um, the ARM CMSYS NN and 
arm and then both of these together. We have um, also contributions to more than 200 open source projects. Uh, the um, 110 out of 136 ARM-based bo boards are supporting the Zephyr OS, uh, the Zephyr Artos. Uh, we are also, um, ARM combined with Linaro is in the top three contributors for the Linux kernel and for Zephyr. Uh, we are really uh, believe that um, we can drive standardization and reduce fragmentation by um, com uh, using open source software to uh, reduce the costs for our customers and allow them to spend more time on differentiating. So this brings me to uh, the summary of my talk. I hope I've convinced you that uh, embedded vision really unlocks uh, a lot of markets and new applications and is uh, estimated to have a huge growth in the near future. Uh, this is enabled by uh, some shifts in technology, like the deep learning gaining more and more momentum and it being accessible to everyone because it enables the feature detection automatically. Also, more and more computers moving from the cloud to the edge, uh, and that makes it scalable because we can have so many embedded devices all around us with vision into them, which vision enabled in them. Uh, one of the key enablers for making developer-friendly vision is software libraries and scripts and open source software frameworks. And this uh, means the final message is that uh, you don't really need to be an expert in machine learning and hardware to ride the wave of embedded vision. So final key takeaway is that the accessible hardware combined with open source software makes developer friendly embedded vision. Um, so that, that's the summary of my talk. I have some references. All the important references have been summarized in the slide for offline reading. Uh, and I really thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. I'd also like to welcome you to the ARM booth, which is in Hall 4, booth 140. Uh, we have quite a few demos there. We also have an embedded quiz that you can take away some prizes from there. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions, except no questions on Brexit, please. Thank you very much. Thank you.